to get into today because we can't have a week without something really stupid happening at Riot. It's just the way of things, Thor. And so in a absolutely well, the news is this has nothing to do with Saudi. So if you're thinking, oh, well, you're well, the fatigue Monty plays, like in theory, this is just about does Riot. It? <laughs> Overtly, at least. Overtly. Let's I mean, say, look, spoiler, all roads lead to Riyadh in the end, buddy. But this is more of like a, you know, this is more of the piece along the way that doesn't have the dot connected necessarily. I, 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 w- I will say that the timing of this is suspicious when we assume that uh, Riot is just inching, inching closer into the warm embrace of Saudi Arabia. And so I'm not saying it's not connected. I can't definitely say that. But it is Very funny that we talked about this on the show previously when the sabbatical happened, but Naz Alataha, who was the head of global LOL esports, has now officially said that she is leaving the company, basically. She's going to stay on for a few more months, help a transition to the new person who will be taking her responsibilities, who is Chris Greeley, who I'm sure you all know and love. Uh, and which it <laughs> becomes interesting in light of certain of stories that we'll talk so about funny. past weeks, you know, <laughs> uh, because True. he was he was actually just apparently doing her job for her this entire time. So Riot has instituted a sabbatical program where you can just leave your job it's and not, not work part. and still get paid, I guess. It's uh, part, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of an abuse. Basically, the short version is she basically took the year off. Then right when she's come back from the year off, she's like, actually, I'm just quitting anyway. It's like, yeah. what's that all about then? <laughs> oh, what's this? That's why if you saw Monty, I used, even though everyone's overused that meme, I used that perfect one of that me- anime meme. You know, where that guy appears in that cloak, like my, oh, my work is done or something. And then, and then he goes, you didn't even do anything. He's like, that's what it feels like. Where was she the last you're an officer doing fucking nothing. Like, anyway, I've got to go now. Like, what were you doing? What were you even doing though? It's so bad, isn't it? I love it. I love how I, well, I love it. It's just how stupid it all is, as usual. It, it, so it is funny. By the way, you know, I, I love, as usual, Riot loves to abuse language. So when they say sabbatical, as far as I can tell, they literally just mean take time off and do nothing, which is not the way sabbatical is used historically in jobs with sabbaticals for example my father is a scientist and he's a university professor and when he took sabbaticals what that meant was traveling to a different institution to do scientific research and like teach classes so it's a it's it's a break from perhaps your normal day-to-day routine you routine you take a year you go off somewhere else you'd still do work like let's be really clear but you focus on that research obviously you still get paid and then you come back so it's a way for uh university professors to actually interact or intermingle with each other around the world um it's one of the reasons why i was a kid i lived in germany for a year for example because my father had a had a sabbatical at the university of heidelberg there so this is all to say that I think Riot is abusing the actual concept of sabbatical. Maybe she was doing something else. Who who can actually know? But it was very funny because when this happened a year ago, and we mentioned it on this show, it was she is leaving literally as the shit is hitting the fan in in, oh, in the timing was very winter. cynical with it when was she so scheduled funny. the sabbatical. You know. <laughs> it wasn't like maybe I should stick around to, I don't know, steer the ship of global lol esports through this storm. I, you know, under normal circumstances, I probably could have left. But now's definitely the time. And then now she, of course, because the storm has not really subsided and they're changing everything now. She's got she's got a peace out forever now. Which, you know, I will not have any love lost for her. We'll get into kind of the history of LOL Esports, I think, and dive into the contributions that were made specifically by her over the years, which have been, in my opinion, quite negligible. Um, But, you know, it is super funny that basically just quitting when times got hard, just literally taking money for a year and and then quitting your gig. There's another one, Monty, and I'm getting really sick and tired of this now, mate. Why are we treating X.com and Reddit like they are the official LOL Wesports website? What are we doing right now? Like, why is her post, Monty, leaving her position at, as, like, head of Riot Global? Why is that just on LOL Esports? Why is it a really long fucking Twitter post? What is this? Like, bro, why is our industry so bad? Why is that not just, like, an official post? Like, what am I missing? Why do we not do official posts anymore on the Riot websites? Like, it's what they're for. 
Uh, well, because then we eventually have to take them down when we make partnerships with the Saudi government, right? When we make a post about Neom and it's really official and it's on the site, it becomes a problem potentially later on. They also, you know, I think don't want to alert uh, potentially their global partners that this that, is going that on. That sounds plausible. Yeah. Um, you know, that that definitely they may not want to be making this a super big deal because I yep. think what they're trying to do is like pass off her responsibilities to somebody else and say, oh, well, this person was already doing that job anyway. So no need to worry about anything, guys, because here's the thing, Thorne. I know when she declared her sab sabbatical in the first place, the team owners were not happy. Right. It's like, wait, what the fuck now? You're I mean, now? Story, if you give the analogy before, Monty, of steering a ship, well, in this analogy, the ship's taken on water. We need all hands on fucking deck. <laughs> yes. We're actually going, I'll just be off on that island over there for a year. Like, we can't do it's that. It's like I'll the like Titanic sinking into into it. It. <laughs> and the know. captain's off in a lifeboat. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. With a glass of champagne. It, it was just completely ridiculous. Um, but I will say, like, you know, this this just ties into, I think, a larger problem because she has been at Riot for over a decade right now. And in general, LOL Esports she has... She in 2012, man. Yeah, she, she is part of a crew. And Riot in general, but in particular, League of Legends and Riot Esports have really loved promoting from within. Like, there's there haven't been a lot of outside hires and usually when they have a vacancy they promote somebody to fill that vacancy rather than getting somebody new to do that and you know this has been going on basically since the beginning but you have to understand how riots esports department started which was nepotism right it was pure nepotism and it was started because brandon beck who was then he was the ceo of riot he was he decided that his 20, I think, 27-year-old brother at the time, Dustin Beck, who is a man with no sports experience, Ginger no e sports guy, experience, <laughs> yeah, ginger guy, uh, comes in and is suddenly the vice president of esports. Okay? So what happened then is Dustin Beck makes a variety of hires. Of course, none of these people, even at the time, so in 2011, in 2012, when this was going on, there were people who were very qualified to be an esports position, endemic people from the industry. Remember, at this point in time, ESL had been around for what over a decade, around a decade. There had been tons of people over there. Riot chose to ignore all of the endemic people from the industry. Many of them who had already been working for ten plus years, been team owners in the past, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, had really good executive experience. In the case of many people at ESL, uh, who still work there, by the way, uh, people at MLG. I mean, you you pick it. They ignored it. Uh, and instead, basically, the people that were hired were kind of um, bootlickers for Dustin Beck. And a lot of these people have now been promoted into executive positions within Riot, but they were never really from the industry. And this is where a lot of the ideas of, hey, you know what? We have all this traditional sports. We were, It's not even they're from traditional sports. They're literally just fans of traditional sports and that's where we got a lot of the really terrible ideas when it comes to format production operation of the circuit taking it internal because you also have to remember that these people justify their existence by basically kill they, they justify their existence by killing the third party circuit because the more internal esports was to riot the more control these people had uh, and the more power they got so it Every action was basically justified to bring it internal, which is slowly, obviously, now being reversed because they're suddenly saying, hey, we really want to do more third party events like we used to inexplicably. Right. Uh, totally inexplicably. And I think there were some positive things, at least in the early days, because what is fair to say about Riot is in the early days of LCS and EU, NA and EU LCS is that there wasn't a third party tournament operator who would have brought the same level of quality. I think that is entirely fair to say. There's, there's a, absolutely no way they would. In the West. One thing I'll say is this. I actually think the problem Riot has when we address this topic is that if you look at their era when they did take over LCS 2013, that was the era when they were just putting in so much more money than an ESL would have spent, Monty, to 
yes. doing the same project that like they actually were quality wise I agree it was way better and obviously they paid the teams way more and pumped all the sure. salaries up and uh, the, the studio things were way better than they would have been. no that's totally true it's just obviously the problem becomes fans won't know this but years later people like ESL did get to that level and did have that amount of investment themselves so eventually so, there was a time where they would have been overtaken and they probably should have given it up but I agree in the early days you have to give it to Riot like they did put a lot of money in and it was a big reason why League of Legends especially but, leveled up in the early days Yeah, but they but, also yeah. you know Thorin the, the, the counter side to that argument is that they didn't have to do it themselves so for example when I was working for OGN which was operated by a third party and was better than anything Riot was putting out product wise they were paying about 50% of the production costs Riot of what it costs to make League of Legends tournaments in Korea, and then OGN and their parent company, CJ, were getting sponsorships or paying for the other 50%. So, you know, the thing about it, Thorin, is like, sure, they did lean on ESL in the early days of, of EU LCS, but they could have provided team subsidies. They could have actually provided third-party tournament operators, you know, paid them money in order to run this as well. And with the same amount of money they were spending, if it had been injected into partnerships or other companies, we don't know what the end result of that would have been. But regardless, like you can say in the early days of EU and NALCS, it was a pretty big uh, upgrade in terms of quality compared to MLG or ESL at the time in which it was made, right? Over time, I think those, those expenses became, you know, it, the difference the gap really closed in a lot of ways, especially in the West, but they were, I, you know, to their credit, they were critical in spending that money and creating those broadcasts. What I, what I will say though, is that NASA's early job was as basically operating, you know, commercial partnerships and sponsorships. Right. And one of the things that was super hilarious about when League of Legends, particularly in North America, was peaking in 2015 and 2016 was that they really didn't have very many sponsors. Right. And what they would what Riot would always say internally was they say when, when the teams, including me, who owned a team, would ask them questions such as, well, why don't you guys get some sponsors? They would say, ha ha ha, we don't want to be NASCAR, basically implying that they didn't want corporate logos over everything. This being the same company who now has, by the way, and with the same people making those decisions who said that quote, oh, well, now we have the Red Bull power play and we've had the Bud Light Ace. And like, way, obviously that, they that did take, NASCARify it hugely. Of course. No, the reason that take was always destined, even the second it was uttered, to be so poorly like thought out and constructed as a premise is because that only works, Monty, if you think of the Riot League of Legends esports as they did at the time, which is like this, almost like this is just a small marketing exercise we do, but the big game this is the real reason we do this. It's just League of Legends the game. And in fact, what you're almost doing back then is you treat it like you'll never be the main thing. You're just esports, this side thing, which is all well and good if you have the money to bankroll it forever yourself but the reason why that was such a poorly thought out statement is one as you see now when they no longer want to bankroll you look fucking stupid because what you basically said Monty, is i actively turned down sponsors so yeah. you sound like an idiot and then secondly in an industry where even the sponsorship can't fund everything now it's just a really badly aged take isn't it like you look back now and you would beg any of those companies to come in in fact some of those companies that would have come in then now won't come in at this point so you've also missed your chance on that one so it now just sounds really silly but it's indicative of how they thought about esports back then for sure well i mean what was funny is like when i was there in meetings where they were discussing this ownership meetings at riot um you know a, a lot of the talk was where are the sponsors and that this is how they would laugh it off and naz was the person who was supposed to be doing that but they said like oh we don't want to do that it should be about the game we don't want to be nascar we don't want to have sponsorships everywhere and then they actually just went ahead and sold those anyway so it just showed it was kind of a cover for their own incompetence and inability to sell sponsors but they also did miss basically the peak of viewership when it came to actually activating these sponsors and there were to to be fair there were sponsors that came along later but I was, and my team, Renegades, was represented by WME, which is one of the biggest agencies in Hollywood. And remember that Riot is located in Los Angeles. And I had agents from WME with me at some of these Riot meetings. And they basically came up to me after they were with me in these meetings and said, 
what the hell is Riot doing? Why don't they get a real agency to represent them? Because they didn't actually have that at the time. And so the, they weren't even trying in a city that has some of the largest entertainment agencies in the world to partner with them in order to get sponsorships done. I mean, it was it was frankly like these agents were, were like appalled and like extremely surprised about the size of this esports league LCS and the lack of sales that were going on. Now, later there were some partnerships. We saw like the Louis Vuitton deal that came through, but was that 2019, I believe. And oh, it was years and years. And yeah, yeah, that was, that was a deal that was looked really shiny on paper and we got the Kiana skin, uh, but it never came back is a thing. Like it was a very short lived deal. Um, and we have seen big global partnerships. However, partnerships like Red Bull, uh, Red Bull is much more interested in access to the IP and the ability to do things like the Red Bull Arena in the offseason than they are in actually sponsoring the esports leagues. Um, and so their esports sponsorship is kind of just incidental for them to get what they actually want, which is the ability to kind of run these events with fans and also with the professional teams. Um, and they love these live activations. You have MasterCard, who has re-upped, right, for many years. We, we've we had uh, Mercedes, who's been a, a big uh, part of the World Championship International events. So there have been some of these deals that have come through, and I'm sure Naz played a role in that. But on the whole, like, the the whole the whole history of sales in lol esports has been really underwhelming i mean don't even get into the media rights side of things right but the sponsorship really missed the peak and even today the sponsorships are way down we've seen lots of sponsors of major american corporations pull out of leagues like the lcs bud light isn't there anymore state farm isn't there anymore um and there haven't been a lot of other deals that have replaced these at any kind of of scale um so it's you know, it's, I would say, not not a huge loss in the end to be shedding some of these executives who were promoted from within, but in my mind, without significant merit uh, to those promotions and were not really instrumental in building anything long lasting. And indeed, I look at what has happened with League of Legends esports, and the only thing I can think of is, well, if you had spent this money to work with partners and had a third party circuit, we probably would have been doing better than we are right now uh, because everything is fucking on fire right now, guys. Like a lot of the, a lot of the teams are going to see their, their stipends like actually decrease next year. Um, there is a contraction in terms of what Riot is doing. They're cutting teams. They're cutting, as we know from their roadmap, they're cutting entire, like basically uh, endemic scenes, right? They're trying to roll everybody into the Pacific region. CB Laws get is allegedly they're planning to have it merged with LCS into the the kind of two division system of North and South. Uh, these are uh, these are like massive changes, but it is reversing the plan of them having all of these local leagues. Like they have been cutting down on the number of local leagues forever for years now and consolidating them into kind of like combined leagues or adding Turkey to EM, like EU masters and these kind of things. So really the plan has failed if we're being honest. And now we're having to undo all of the domestic, the local domestic leagues that are not tier one regions that we had previously. So it's not great. And then when we talk about Chris Greeley, who's the, the guy who's replacing him, he actually presided over the LCS when it was probably product wise, the worst it ever was yep. like it was a complete garbage product when this guy was commissioner and if we take even though the that was the era monty where in theory it was the most money in league of legends like you actually could have done the most in that period well it was also the pandemic and there are certain problems associated with that but at the same time if you guys remember the incredibly cringe alienware dome idea that they tried to pull off as a sponsorship like the product was incredibly out of touch with its fan base and i think you know just pick what a commissioner is because if a commissioner is the product guy like we have with mark z right now i think mark z is is doing a good job on revitalizing the product but if that's the case and it always was a product job the question is why was it so fucking terrible previously why were all of these horrible decisions being made? Why were we dealing with broadcast talent where there's like 10 different analysts on this broadcast that were just swapping out willy nilly? Why is there nothing interesting happening within the broadcast itself? Why is production going down the tubes? Why is it boring? 
You know what I mean? And this is when LEC was absolutely smashing them and they were not taking any notes from LEC whatsoever. And also, this is when viewership was actually going up because of the pandemic, guys. When people couldn't go outside and this was free entertainment, esports viewership went up and the product was miserable. It was miserable during this era. So I wouldn't have a lot of confidence uh, that this is going to get any better uh, over time because it's like, Again, you can't, You actually just can't find them hiring somebody from the outside to do the job or mixing it up with unique ideas. It always has to be somebody frequently who has not done a very good job within Riot and obviously hasn't done a good job because the product is bad, right? And what they're putting out is bad and they're not doing the sales and they're losing sponsors. And now all of a sudden that person is, is in a higher position of power. It's outrageous. It's crazy. This is also why the key thing that you pointed out is that they came from Riot Games, all these people. These people were nobodies who just got promoted through the system. By the way, already, I tell you a terrible red flag right there. That implies to me the higher-ups want their original hires to be their top hires so they can brag about how what geniuses they are with their eye and like, oh, look at the person I scouted and I brought him up and I developed him, which is already like, you just don't do that. As you said, Monty, people like ESL have done this many times. If you have the option to take someone from the real world of like a sport that does what you want to do one day, you just take that guy. If that exec wants to come and join, of course you bring him in. Like he's going to know and have connections you'll never have as a pleb from the industry. The difference with Riot is they are so absolutely self-centered and indulgent. They will put someone who used to just be a kid with a red shirt, like an event like, hey, and we're Riot, like five years ago. They'll put that person in a room with like, you know, head of fucking marketing budget at a giant company and go, have at it. And, and I, I, I can't even imagine what those people are thinking. I'm sure everyone here as, a, as an appeal to the plebs out there, surely you've seen the show Mad Men, right, guys? Right? In the show Mad Men, you already understand how essential, like, social proof is knowing the person, you having it in, them being able to recommend you, you having past work, you having a reputation. If you just put some idiot in a room with someone, they're going to fuck it up already. And it's just insulting. Like, why are you sending me the equivalent of what used to be your intern to now negotiate a giant deal? Like, why, why are you bringing me someone who used to work for, like, the NBA or they worked, you know, even if, it, by the way, even if it's esports, maybe they worked for ESL for 10 years and did sales but, and did things around the world. Like, this would be the obvious way you'd do here's, it. Here's the outrageous thing, Thor. To my knowledge, there is not... Not a single person on Riot Esports executive team who actually is an OG esports person or comes from traditional sports. I don't think yes. either of those things are represented. We are not seeing people who have 20 years of esports experience as executives at Riot. Like, how is it possible that their entire executive team can have none of these people? I mean, the, the answer is, is because they do culture fit. And if you were from one of these industries, you would probably be not really happy with the way that they're doing things because I know basically nobody who has been in this industry for multiple decades outside of Riot who thinks what Riot is doing is the smart or best way to do things. And if you actually prove that you are correct, it then makes all of those people who have spent the last five years of their lives derping around on these projects look bad. And then, then what happens, right? And a lot of this too is like the right. constant focus at Riot. Well, we have to keep things internal. We have to keep things internal. We uh, It all has to be internal all the time because they can't be proven wrong. And if somebody else does it better, if you were to give the license to a third party and they were to do a better job, what is the justification for you to continue to have work, right? And especially I'd because a lot of these people well. are just massively overpaid relative to the actual value they're producing. To see more cool, funny, interesting clips based on topics from my content, well, subscribe to this channel then, or, you know, be a pleb and don't.